All day Sunday at anchor, the storm had gone down a great deal, but the sea had not. It was still piling its frothy hills high in air outside, as we could plainly see with the glasses. We could not properly begin a pleasure excursion on Sunday. We could not offer untried stomachs to so pitiless a sea as that. We must lie still till Monday, and we did. But we had repetitions of church and prayer meetings, and so, of course, we were just as eligibly situated as we could have been anywhere. I was up early that Sabbath morning and was early to breakfast. I felt a perfectly natural desire to have a good, long, unprejudiced look at the passengers at the time when they should be free from self-consciousness, which is at breakfast when such a moment occurs in the lives of human beings at all. I was greatly surprised to see so many elderly people, I might almost say so many venerable people. A glance at the long lines of heads was apt to make one think it was all gray, but it was not. There was a tolerably fair sprinkling of young folk, and another fair sprinkling of gentlemen and ladies who were non-committal as to age being neither actually old or absolutely young. The next morning we weighed anchor and went to sea. It was a great happiness to get away from this draggy, dispiriting delay. I thought there never was such gladness in the air before, such brightness in the sun, such beauty in the sea. I was satisfied with the picnic then, and with all its belongings. All my malicious instincts were dead within me, and America faded out of sight. I think a spirit of charity rose up in their place that was as boundless for the time being as the broad ocean that was heaving its billows about us. I wish to express my feelings. I wish to lift up my voice and sing. But I did not know anything to sing, so I was obliged to give up the idea. It was no loss to the ship, though, perhaps. It was breezy and pleasant, but the sea was still very rough. One could not promenade without risking his neck. At one moment the bowsprit was taking a deadly aim at the sun in mid-heaven, and at the next it was trying to harpoon a shark in the bottom of the ocean. What a weird sensation it is to feel the stem of a ship sinking swiftly from under you and see the bow climbing high away among the clouds. One safest course that day was to glass a railing and hang on. Walking was too precarious a pastime. By some happy fortune I was not seasick. That was a thing to be proud of. I had not always escaped before. If there is one thing in the world that will make a man peculiarly and insufferably self-conceited, it is to have his stomach behave itself the first day at sea when nearly all his comrades are seasick. Such a venerable fossil, shawled to the chin and bandaged like a mummy, appeared at the door of the after-deck house, and the next lurch of the ship shot him out into my arms. I said, Good morning, sir. It's a fine day. He put his hand on his stomach and said, Oh, my! and then staggered away and fell over the coop of a skylight. Presently another old gentleman was projected from the same door with great violence. I said, Calm yourself, sir. There's no hurry. It is a fine day, sir. He also put his hand on his stomach and said, Oh, my! and reeled away. In a little while another veteran was discharged abruptly from the same door clawing at the air for saving support. I said, Good morning, sir. It is a fine day for pleasuring. You were about to say? Oh, my! I thought so. I anticipated him, anyhow. I stayed there and was bombarded with the old gentleman for an hour, perhaps, and all I got out of any of them was, Oh, my! I went away then in a thoughtful mood. I said, This is a good pleasure excursion. I like it. The passengers are not garrulous, but still they are sociable. 
I like those old people, but somehow they all seem to have the oh my rather bad. I knew what was the matter with them. They were seasick, and I was glad of it. We all like to see people seasick when we are not ourselves. Playing whist by the cabin, lamps when it's storming outside is pleasant. Walking the quarter deck in the moonlight is pleasant. Smoking in the breezy foretop is pleasant when one is not afraid to go up there. But these are all feeble and commonplace compared with the joy of seeing people suffering the miseries of seasickness. I picked up a good deal of information during the afternoon. At one time I was climbing up the quarter deck when the vessel's stem was in the sky and was smoking a cigar and feeling passably comfortable. Somebody ejaculated, Come now, that won't answer. Read the sign up there. No smoking abaft the wheel. It was Captain Duncan, chief of the expedition. I went forward, of course. I saw a long spyglass lying on a desk in one of the upper deck staterooms back of the pilot house, and I reached after it. There was a ship in the distance. Ah, uh ah, -uh, hands off. Come out of that. I came out of that. I said to the deck sweep, but in a low voice, Who's that overgrown pirate with the whiskers and the discordant voice? It's Captain Bursley, executive officer, sailing master. I loitered about a while, and then, for want of something better to do, fell to carving a railing with my knife, somebody said in an insinuating, admonitory voice. Now say, my friend, don't you know any better than to be whittling the ship all to pieces that way? You ought to know better than that. I went back and found the deck sweep. Who is that smooth-faced, animated outrage yonder in the fine clothes? That's Captain L., the owner of the ship. He's one of the main bosses. In the course of time, I brought up the starboard side of the pilot house and found a sextant lying on a bench. Now I said, they take the sun through this thing. I should think I might see that vessel through it. I'd hardly got it to my eye when somebody touched me on the shoulder and said deprecatingly, I'll have to get you to give that to me, sir. If there's anything you'd like to know about taking the sun, I'd as soon tell you as not, but I don't like to trust anybody with that instrument. If you want any figuring done, aye, aye, sir. He was, he was gone to answer a call from the other side. I sought the deck sweep. Who is that spider-legged gorilla yonder with a sanctimonious countenance? It's Captain Jones, sir, the chief mate. Well, this goes clear ahead of anything I've ever heard of before. Do you, now I ask you as a man and a brother, do you think I could venture to throw a rock here in any direction without hitting a captain of this ship? Well, sir, I don't know. I think you're likely to fetch the captain of the watch, maybe, because he's standing right yonder in the way. I went below, meditating and a little downhearted. I thought, if five cooks can spoil a broth, what may not five captains do to a pleasure excursion? 